Welcome to this discussion evening number three. Uh, the purpose of this meeting is not to make decisions, but instead to learn and be inspired, broaden our perspective. And this is from the principle number five in XR, we value reflecting and learning. The topic for today is uh, roadblocks. We could uh, also discuss like a more general topic like action design and strategy, but uh, we thought that we, it would be interesting to talk about roadblocks because we have seen some some issues with this in Sweden. There are some uh, apparent advantages like um, we want to do civil disobedience where there are people. So in a city center or in the streets, we are seen by others. Uh, it's a kind of a simple action. I mean, you don't really need to do much to block a street. It's, it's a good practice for, for new rebels who want to practice being disobedient. And also like the streets is a natural place for uprisings. So there are some, um, some uh, advantages in doing roadblocks, but there are also criticism about this. So one of them is that roadblocks is not so performative, meaning that the action itself does not really show any solution or like showing the world that we want to live in. And it might not be so easy for anyone outside of the action that is looking at this to, to connect it with the climate crisis and the ecological crisis. Uh, so it might just make people annoyed. All right, so we have invited Insulate Britain since uh, they have done a lot of roadblocks and we thought it would be interesting to hear their experience of this. So let's see, we have Roger with us and we have um, Indigo. And so uh, can I just hand over to you and um, you can talk about your experiences. Yeah, thanks very, thanks very much. Uh, it's lovely to speak to you all and um, suddenly a bit nervous. I was expecting about six people or something. <laughs> we just have a little chat. <laughs> so I suddenly realized I have to do some impressive presentation so i'll see see how i get on uh but it's lovely to see you all it's fantastic uh to have all you great people on the call um yeah so i'll i'll try not to spend too much time talking which because in uh, indigo's i think you'll go through some of the technical sides of it i'm just going to give the broader arguments and some data i suppose on how to change the world when we're facing the end of the world which is the job at hand, as we know. So um, just to be clear, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not some official spokesperson for XR or IB or anything. So it's my interpretation. Uh, I'm one of the Extinction Rebellion co-founders and I helped to design the Insulate Britain campaign uh, in January this year. So the basic, uh, my basic approach is, is not to focus really on a tactic, but a tactic in a context. In other words, I find like talking about tactics like quite reductive. What we really need to be thinking about is how we're going to create a civil resistance explosion in the Western world. The powerful enough to either force governments to create legislation to reduce carbon emissions or remove governments at this stage of the game, given we've just had COP26 and there's hundreds of thousands of activists around the world gradually realizing it's civil resistance or extinction. And that's really what Extinction Rebellion was set up to do uh, originally, was to make that proposition to the climate movement that we have to go into high level civil disobedience, otherwise we're all dead, or at least our children are. So it couldn't be more serious and it couldn't be more precedent, I suppose, given that we've just finished COP26 where nothing again is happening. So it focuses our minds. So really like the proposition is, what do we do with our limited resources to maximize our effectiveness? And what is the role of road blocking in, in that strategy, okay? So that's what I would like to sort of address. So the first point really is, uh, is that it's totally possible for a small number of people to force legislative change on a Western democracy. It's happened many, many times in history and there's a common pattern on how it works. So 
there's a way to do it and there's a way not to do it with all due respect <laughs> okay so the way not to do it is for instance to do like single iterative one day days of action right we've had those for 30 years they don't work for instance um and the way to do it is to do two things which uh, insulate britain was based upon the freedom riders episode in 1961 that galvanized and transformed the civil rights movement into a mass civil disobedience uh, momentum, which created the big, uh, the big civil disobedience episodes at Birmingham and, and Selma. And what those two people did were they animate that small group of people animated by two basic principles to do whatever it nonviolently takes to capture the attention of the nation. And secondly, they decided they could not afford to lose. In other words, they had to engage in a level of sacrifice which would enable them to win. And as you may know, they, this involved them going down to the American South uh, on interstate buses and getting beaten up, put into prison and all the rest of it. So what we came up with at the beginning of Insulate Britain was this notion of what can a few hundred people do or even a few dozen people do which will capture the attention of the UK population. And there's only really one thing that can do it within the nonviolent tradition, and that is to walk onto motorways. Okay, if you've got a better idea, that we all would love to hear it. <laughs> okay, the great thing about motorways is that they are uh, very easy to get onto, and you can't really stop people. So uh, Indigo will go into the nuts and bolts of how that happens as variations of the feet. And the proof is in the pudding, as the English phrase goes. In other words, like this isn't just a theoretical proposition. We have effectively proven that this works because 100 people created the biggest, uh, the biggest like climate story in the UK. So think about this. This was just 100 people. Oftentimes it was like about 60 people, but they went. These, these are the key criteria. They went on the busiest motorway in the UK, number one. Number two, they went 17 times, right, in seven weeks, two to three times a week. In other words, you have to keep going. You know, you have to give up your job, blah, 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 right? This is serious civil resistance episode. Uh, and obviously, you've got to maintain absolute nonviolent discipline when people kick you or shout at you or, you know, push you along with their car. Uh, and what that produced was 160. Uh, 167 national newspaper articles, right? So there's only about six or seven national newspapers. So that's an average of about 40 articles per newspaper, okay? Uh, it produced like five or six headlines in the national newspapers and several dozen TV interviews. And within four weeks, the name recognition of Insulate Britain had gone from zero to 77%. In order to 77% of UK people knew what Insulate Britain was. Okay. And the head of an NGO said to us, they'd never known a campaign to go from zero to 77% name recognition in four weeks. That's what getting on the motorway does for you. Okay. Now, obviously, that does not mean that, you know, the house of cards is going to collapse and you're going to get legislative change. But what it does mean is you've created the necessary foundation for political change. In other words, if you don't do that, you're not in the ballpark. What blocking motorways does is put you in the ballpark. And there's other aspects of the campaign which, you know, uh, sort of have, have contributed to uh, the success, as you might say, uh, and that's to choose a specific aim of legislative change you want the government to enact. So you don't want to go on the motorway and just say, climate change in Sweden is a problem, right? Everyone knows it's a problem. What you want to do is go on the motorways in Sweden or Norway or Finland and go, we want X, right? And you have to think about what that X is, which needs to be some con concrete form of legislation. So in the UK, the biggest the biggest reduction in carbon emissions per unit of investment is house insulation. So that may or may not be the case in your countries, but you choose something that's popular and graspable 
and can be said in two words. In other words, everyone knew what we were about because we were called the demand. So you call the, you call the campaign the demand, right? So every time you're on telly, they're saying, insulate Britain. <laughs> and of course, no one can object to it because it's a popular bread and butter demand. And then like, like um, Martin Luther King did and Freedom Riders did, you make the demand so small that everyone thinks, why don't they just do it, right? So it's insulate all the houses of the poorest people in the UK. So I don't think on a single interview, anyone actually, uh, anyone actually uh, disagreed with, with the call for, in, for the, with, with the demand. You see what I mean? Because it's a no brainer. Um, and incidentally, this is a little bit of a side issue. If you what I would advise you to look at the uh, interviews because another major innovation of this campaign was not to answer the questions in the interviews. Because as soon as you answer the questions, then you just spend like 10 minutes discussing protest politics and whether it's a good idea to stand in the road or not. So we basically went in with what we need to say because they've been waffling for 30 years and we have something important to say, which is we have three to four years to save the next generation, which is about the biggest news in the history of humanity. So completely justified in dominating the TV conversation. Well, more and more people are trying to do their bit to help tackle climate change. They're taking it personally. But, uh, but the high costs of environmentally friendly choices like electric cars, mm. uh, these new boilers, leave many wondering if it's just too expensive to save the planet. Well, following on from the latest report that the UK is still lagging behind on its climate policy, many question how our individual behaviour really could make a difference if the government isn't moving quicker. Well, we all saw the news pictures last night and we're joined now by climate activist Assad Rehman, UN Ambassador for Climate Change, Dale Vince, and Liam Norton. These are the pictures I'm referring to from Insulate Britain. That's the climate change activist group which brought the M25 juddering to a standstill for many hours of the day yesterday. And we're going to start with you, Liam. Thanks very much for coming in this morning. Now, this is not a flippant question, OK? I just wonder what makes you and the people who performed that demonstration yesterday clairvoyant. Because how can you possibly know what's in the vehicles that you're holding up for hours? For example, if you just bear, bear with me on this question, how do you know that there aren't parents with a child who's going to an absolutely vital appointment with their cancer specialist? How do you know there's not a funeral cortege and that people are going to their mother's or father's funeral? How do you know that there aren't people going to, to them is a vital job interview, which might actually be to do with helping to save the planet. You don't know any of these things, mm. and yet you're taking huge risks with other people's lives as individuals. What gives you that right and what gives you that foresight? Well, I agree with you that we don't know. So you're completely right. Um, and I don't think it's about what gives us the right. Um, I think it's about what is the reality that we're in at the moment. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that if you, uh, Sir David King, the chief scientific advisor to the British government, has said that we have, through what we do, in the next three to four years will determine the future of humanity. Now, you're an intelligent person, Richard, right? Can you read between the lines of what three to four years will determine the future of humanity? Can you read between and the lines? And you're an intelligent person who's admitting that they're not clairvoyant. Can you explain to me as, say, for example, the parent of a seven-year-old child who has an absolutely critical hospital appointment to deal with their potentially terminal cancer, but a, a, an appointment that may save their lives, and they find themselves sitting behind one of your roadblocks for hours on end and missing that appointment or, or that treatment. Can you justify that? I'd be furious. Well, then why are you doing it? Because, as I've just said, what we do in the next three to four years will determine the future of humanity. So this is the situation that we find ourselves in. So you're and prepared, that to, so you're prepared need to, to risk that, that person you're would need to... You're prepared to risk that child's cancer treatment and potentially life, because you don't know. We're talking about many thousands of vehicles mm -hmm. stuck behind these protesters. By, by the law of yeah. averages, there are going to be critical journeys terrible, that are being interrupted and stopped. Can I give you a definition of something? Yeah. And tell me what you think of it. And, and you are an intelligent person, so I'd like to know what you think. This is a definition. A tendency towards an actual exercise of strong autocratic or dictatorial control over individuals, or severe social regimentation, forcible suppression of opposition, and a belief that the greater cause takes precedence over individual interests. Do you know what that's a definition of? Go on. Fascism. OK. 
Well, I don't think it's fascist to have a demand of universal care. And that's what Insulate Britain are talking about. What we're talking about is the best value for money for reducing emissions per pound spent. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of proper jobs, meaningful jobs. And we're talking about stopping the deaths of thousands of our old people, which is what happens because old age pensioners have to choose between food or heat. But so that's what's going on in the, the United price? Kingdom people at the moment. In, but but, is, but, but Richard, just the, let me finish. I'm coming in on that point because it's, it's a perfectly fair point and I've got a, a perfectly good... Insulate Britain is about why universal is it, why care. Why is it reasonable to be in pursuit of those perfectly understandable aims and ambitions to completely risk the health, the lives and the, uh, not just getting to work on time, but the mm -hmm. kind of scenarios I've outlined. Why is that a price that people have to pay in order to support willy-nilly your ambitions? Because wh who it's you fascism. should... who Yeah, well, if you want to talk about fascism, right, it's using weak people and using lies. And what we're talking about is a truth. And that's what I'm talking about. And that's what Sir David King's talking about when he's talking about what we do in the next three to four years will determine the future of humanity. What Insulate Britain are talking about is a universal care that's what we're talking about. And you should get the government on here. You should get the Minister for the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. Well, we have government ministers on this programme every day. And, and you should be asking them why it is that they're not looking after the British people's interests. And as soon as a meaningful statement is made by the government, do you know how many homes need to be insulated and retrofitted by 2050? It's 1.5 a minute. How many are being done? Zero. We've got an absolute Liam, crisis think, in terms of what we need to do to decarbonise our homes at the moment. Is to try and get people to insulate their homes. Is there not a more popular way you could do it than bringing the M25 to a standstill? Um, as, as Richard said, if even one person in one of those vehicles was trying to get to hospital, you've lost everybody. Well. <laughs> This isn't about who we lose and, and who we gain. This is about you said asking... That's exactly what it's about. Well, this is about asking the government to get on with the job and they're not doing. And that's what this is about. And, and nobody's speaking about the reality of the situation that we're talking about here. You've been here. talking about it all You've week. You've been talking about melting ice caps, which you should have been doing 10 years ago. So, um... Yeah. In terms of the theory of change and what this blocking roads does, it's important to understand that when a society is engaged in a holistic sense in an act of collective immorality, like, you know, like colonial oppression and uh, not giving women the vote, uh, racist outrage, climate, you know, catastrophe. That is that is not the moment to engage in small scale action. The the method of political change in the in the circumstances we find ourselves in is to disrupt the whole of society in order to force the whole of society to have a conversation about what the fuck it's doing. Right? That's how it works. So you shouldn't compare this project with a small-scale environmental or political campaign. What you should compare it with is the major confront moral confrontations of the 20th century. And in those moral confrontations, what, the way people brought about change was by disrupting the general public in order to create a big national debate. So the classic examples, for instance, are in the UK, the suffragettes went along Oxford Street and smashed all the windows of the, of the shops. There was nothing prefigurative about it, to say the least. And there was nothing about shops in Oxford Street that had anything to do with women's right to the vote. They did it in order to create outrage, because through the process of creating outrage, they could put forward the proposition that it's obscene that women haven't got the vote. So another example is it act up in New York when gay people were dying in the corridors of hospitals because the system hated gay people and they weren't you know, putting any money into investing AIDS, they went and closed down the stock exchange in New York. And the stock exchange in New York had nothing prefigurative and nothing to do with gay rights. So why did they close down the stock exchange in New York? Because they were forcing into the face of the American public the obscenity of allowing people to die 
in hospital corridors because no one gave a fuck about gay people. You see what I mean? It was emotional, it was uncompromising, and it was like, you got to change, right? You know, it's, it's, an act, it's an act of outrage. And that's how it works, right? You know, large scale political change works through the fusion of mass disruption of the public with moral outrage, which is exactly what we have to show post COP. Um, so, you know, I'm not against prefigurative actions. I'm not against specific small campaigns. All I'm saying is in this particular context in 2021, you have to like close Sweden down. You've got to close Finland down. That's what you've got to propose to people and keep going until you put in prison or, you know, you're basically dominated the, the political debate. So the last, the last thing I would say is, is, is Insulate Britain is 98% is Extinction Rebellion people. And the reason we called it a different name was because we wanted to create an alliance of the willing. And this was the same with ACT UP, it was the same with the suffragettes, it was the same with the Freedom Riders, how political change happens is the radicalization of a movement through an independent iteration. In other words, like 20 people on this call decide to go for it and 20 people don't. And the 20 people go, we're gonna do it anyway, right? In other words, we're free agents. And that's, that's how it works, is those 20 people go off and they, they set a date and they do it. And then that creates such a stir that then you have a second iteration and you go again with 100 people or 500 people. And then of course you start to win. So for instance, like with Insulate Britain, it started with four people in a room, you know, myself and Indigo, sort of looking slightly nervously at each other going, how the hell's this gonna work? You know, and we got 20 people and then we got 100 people and there was only 10 people running around doing the work. But now that we've basically been the biggest story on the climate in the UK, we've got 60 people working on the next iteration We've got 19 part-time people and 10 full-time people. So we're getting to the level of mobilization that XR had in its early days. And, and the moral of the tale there is if you want to change society, you have to do something outrageous that is going to inspire people and morally like bring them forward, right? To say, yes, this is the way to do it. And I'm going to join you. I'm going to give up my job or whatever it is. And, and it also inspires funders because there's like loads of people around the world who are dying to give money to something that is actually gonna work, right? Rather than just go for the motions. So this, this afternoon, I've just applied for $200,000 of funding. And that's going to enable people to leave their jobs and work full time. And major civil resistance requires dozens of full time people, you know, depending on the size of your country. You see what I mean? This is a serious proposition. So this is what blocking roads does, okay? It's not a little add-on. It's like the central tactic. It's a central tactic um, to create a civil resistance mobilization. And Insulate Britain has inspired this creation of projects now in Australia, Canada, Australia, Germany, Austria, Czech Republic, and Italy, all of whom are going to block motorways. So I'll just finish on that note that you don't want to be left out. Okay, that's it. Um, Indigo, where are you? You can tell the, the, more, the, more, yeah. the more sort of grounded version comes from Indigo. Then he gives the business card, you know, it's yeah. like insulate Britain double glazing salesperson. <laughs> Um, thank you for having us, everyone. Um, and yeah, it's great to connect with people who aren't just uh, in the UK. And um, yeah, I don't know what's going on in the Swedish climate movement, but I'm really pleased to be here and to connect with you. And remember, we're a bigger struggle and just, you know, 150 people running around London. Um, uh, so um, what to say? Um, so yeah, why, why, why did we start this conversation about blocking motorways? Like, it's because um, we started with the question of like, what is a proportionate action to the scale of the crisis that we face? So it's not like a sort of 
shopping around what do I like the look of like I've designed actions blocking coal mines and blocking arms factories and we've gone out for a day we've had a really good looking action and we've all really meant what we did and the press cut press results for all the energy that goes in is like relatively small and we can't explode the conversation big enough to say that the crisis that's coming towards us is a universal crisis that affects everyone and everything forevermore and like when we start with that question what is the proportionate reaction to this crisis we explode the debate much bigger than um things that i really love to do which is hold banners in really important places and to maybe do a lock on once a year but it's like we're in the global north at this moment in time in britain we've just hosted this cop, cop conference which has been quite mobilizing here in the uk but we have to step into this privilege and to really act like as if life depends on it because at this moment it really does um i think that um when we were having these conversations and really um, talking about the crisis in these terms, we became aware that we are ready to go to prison and we are ready to be fined large amounts of money and we are ready to build the networks and the communities to support each other through that. And it's been hugely, um, like it's allowed people to grow hugely throughout this year um, uh, to, to form these networks to, to make Insulate Britain happen. Um, so yeah, how did we do it? We started a year ago with a conditional commitment and initially it was very, very slow progress. When you want someone to sign a form that says you need 120 people to do it and you've only got four people signed up, it's, it's really a hard sell. Then you get past 40 and you're away and people, people start to realize that it's um, generating momentum and it's something that they want to do. So you, you can make that on the Action Network um, website. Um, so uh, we had a very open recruitment process. So we held talks in church halls and uh, online Zooms and in XR groups that would let us saying, we want 120 people to block motorways to demand that the government insulates Britain. So it's really clear and simple what you want people to do. They either can sign up or they don't sign up. Um, we were holding like uh, our responsibilities talks, which talked about the crisis. And then we had another call, which was building trust and courage, where people could come and just talk about the, their own worries and their own personal lives and decide whether it's something that they, they wanted to do. Um, we then formed the block teams, which is uh, was 15 people from, uh, from their region so that they could meet and talk about why why they've signed up um, and we had an mvda training which lasted a whole day which really prepared people for sitting on the road having drivers yelling in their faces screaming that their children wants to go to school screaming that you're holding at ambulances the police dragging you off the road with one arm and really let people see, realize that our commitment to non-violence in this action has to be paramount um, otherwise it's not going to work and I am astounded you know that this this training really does seem to have really embedded that in people and we have seen people being so passive even in the face of like so peaceful in the face of such aggression from um, police and the public and other motorists um, uh, yeah groups stayed in a house to get houses together and um there was one person who was in charge of that group and they 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 knew the whole plan and they they could then tell that to to the rest of the group that they they were the decision maker in in their team to make things like more more quick and simple um so what we wanted at the start of the camp well what what the campaign proposed is a dilemma to, to the government to allow us to continue to disrupt the motorways of Britain, causing huge economic um, damage to the economy, economic damage to the economy. <laughs> That's a tongue twister. Um, and um, uh, and continually breaking open this media space with this high profile disruption, or they would be able to. Uh, lock us up in Britain you can be put in prison on remand which is where you go in waiting trial or you could be sentenced to prison which is what it looks like may happen to some insulate Britain 
people in the future. Um, we were expecting that they would put people on remand, but they, they chose not to. And that's what enabled this campaign to go into a mode of attrition where we went out time and time again and again and again. There are people who have been on the road 17 times. So we've got over 800 arrests and only 150 people who were signed up to do the action. So it's like changing the mindset of people to realize that if they're supported in what a place to stay and um, a community of people who are doing it with them that you can go out you can have a day rest and you can go back again you can go out you can have a day's rest and you can go back again and um ultimately that's what enabled us to be the big media storm not the fact that we blocked the motorway once the fact that we were like some annoying fly on this big beast like it keeps coming back <laughs> you know um right about them again and again and again um yeah, and I think it really helped that um, we we put people forward as spokespeople who aren't the normal academic people who know all the climate science. These were electricians, builders, um, vicars, dentists, just putting putting people who who are relatable to the British public as as our spokes. Um, uh, and then ultimately, like the actual blocking of the M25, like, let's be honest, nobody apart from maybe some, maybe some people do like it, but I didn't want to block the M25. I find roads really fucking scary and like they're really fast moving and they're really dangerous things and there's obviously lorries on that motorway and it's a horrible place to be with all the pollution and the dust, but it's like, we knew that this tactic would enable us to spread this message to a huge audience and we knew that we were going to um, have a lot of hatred from the press and the general public but time and time again every commentator on this said I don't like what they're doing but I do agree we're not doing enough for the environment I don't like what they're doing but I do agree we should insulate all the homes and like our job in this civil resistance isn't to be liked, it's to be effective. And time and time again, people admitting we're not doing enough for the environment, admitting we're not you know, doing enough to bring people out of fuel poverty, that's going to have a big effect on the on the policy makers or on the people who have power and on the business of the country. So um, we're moving out of this space where we have to be like totally ethically pure in everything we do and moving into a space of what's the best move here? How can we be strategic and make, you know, get the job done? Um, uh, yeah, we had two ways of, of doing it. One, which was blocking at the junction itself. So we didn't block the main carriageway. We sat on the roundabouts, which were just off the motorways. And that creates massive disruption up through the city and up back onto the road. But it meant that people could move out onto stationary traffic at the traffic light. Um, it, and then we had another tactic, which was to stand on the hard shoulder and either to move into the traffic as it's moving or to, in some instances, the police stop the traffic to remove the people off the road and therefore the road was stopped in that way. So I suppose there were there were three outcomes that could could happen. Um, we use the same banners over and over again. So yeah, it really just drummed into people. We are the people with orange high vis who want the government to insulate Britain. Um, and yeah, and now I suppose we're going into a process of how how can the group still keep meeting, keep supporting each other through this. And tomorrow there's a group of nine people who've had um, committal papers from the High Court and they'll be going into the Royal Courts of Justice and they're perhaps going to be sent to prison for this case because they've made an injunction, which is like um, a piece of civil law which stops people going on roads in Britain so we're seeing the government um overreact like they first they put this injunction on the M25 then we went to other roads then they put the injunction on the other roads and eventually now they've injuncted the bridge next to our parliament and they've injuncted the whole strategic road network so they've basically banned protest at the moment <laughs> um and it's like some people would say that's bad but we're saying that's good they're showing their true colors they're traitors the system's unfit for purpose and um, 
you know, they're going to lock up Vickers now and show everyone that that's the case. So, yeah, that's where we are. All right, thank you. Um, and uh, thank you very much for the presentation, um, Roger. Um, uh, by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm a good friend of Stephen Hancock, um, as you know. Um, all right, so um, I just wanted to say that uh, I totally, fully, 110% agree on the need to escalation and, and creating mass disruption. Uh, for me, that's not really the, the issue uh, that is uh, concerning me. Uh, what, what, I'm, what I'm having problem with is um, if you want to go beyond um, changing one policy or law, um, and that's necessary if we're talking about the climate crisis, we need to change and transform the political economy. Uh, if you want to do that, you need to create a sustainable mass civil disobedience movement. And I don't think it's sustainable to do something that is uh, targeting the ordinary uh, population when the idea is to target uh, the political economic system. So that's my problem. Thank you. Um, hi. Um, so, yeah, also thank you for the, for the presentation and all. I was inspired by... Uh, um, to, to hear about the, um, how to say, uh, she described uh, that, uh, um, uh, like the, uh, like the, how do you say, the dedication uh, and uh, the group, sort of the group process, so people could rest and go back to the street and then come back and rest again. Uh, so it seemed like the, the, the way of doing actions were, were very, um, yeah, just ongoing for a long time, and that was uh, was inspiring. Here we've been doing sort of one day or two day. I mean, Oslo was one week, but still uh, not in that uh, long long term uh, way. Uh, so that was that's something I will take with me from from this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Sara. Would you like to continue? And I I kind of missed the presentation though, so I would just listen in. Okay. Thank you. Jonas? This presentation mainly raised questions um, about the strategic choice of highways. Why, why didn't you choose air force, airports or uh, something else like that? And I was wondering if that had to do with the level of the crime or something. So I would be interested in hearing more about that. And uh, I was also interested about the support roles, how many support roles are needed for 100 blockers. Um, and also like practical issues with with uh, establishing the blockade on a motorway because you can't just jump straight out uh, on the road because there would be safety issues. Yeah, well, I sort of live and breathe this stuff. <laughs> I sort of I do about four four meetings a week. I've done about fifty public meetings. So um, yeah, but it's good to you know it's great to. I love talking to international audiences because there's no point things happening in the UK or Sweden, right? It needs to happen in 20 countries at the same time. Um, and uh, that's why I'm here. So I'm interested, you know, see what can happen in Scandinavia. Uh, I've been following Insulate Britain since the start of the campaign. It was one, one of the really interesting thing, things happening lately um and one very interesting point is that it throws sort of action logic you know far far away from what it's doing and blocking motorways to insulate britain it makes no sense but it's uh, sort of enormous disruption um and would that would that work so that's that was that would be interesting to see will what will boris johnson and the government do I saw some comment saying that they can never insulate Britain after this because then they've given in to this kind of pressure and 150 people can get more or less what they want if they block a motorway. Um, so it's, that would, that's interesting. Will it work? Uh, because it's something different. Yeah, I could uh, ask my questions again if that's okay and if uh, you have a response Roger about the 
strategic choice of highways um, why not other disruptive uh, targets and uh, did it have something to do with the level of uh, the crime you, you have to you can't see you can't see what we did is it's incorrect or problematic to see what we've done in the context of just that iteration what we're trying to build here is a meta strategic process what I mean by that is a multi iterative process and the the first the first element of this iteration is to create culture coherence finance and mobilization right so it doesn't really matter what we do on the first iteration right because we're not going to win but because it's a first iteration what 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 we need to understand is if we're going to do what Stellan has said, which I totally agree, which is bring a halt to the political economy, then you're painting castles in the air unless you have a resources, culture, money and time. You see what I mean? So we know what that looks like in the UK. We need 300 people in prison or we need 3000 arrests in 10 days, right? Because we have contacts in the establishment. And they know, right, the British state is actually not that strong because of austerity. There's a high probability the police will start defecting at, at the stage of 300, 3,000 arrests, for instance. So this is a data-driven process. It's not ideological in that sense. So how do you build that culture? You build that cultures of resistance are built through the process of resistance. That's the fundamental point. You see what I'm trying to say? So it doesn't matter that it's the motorway. Could have been ports. What matters is social confrontation because social confrontation creates its own mobilization. In, in other words, like most of those people decided to go on the road three times. So why did they decide to go on the road 17 times? Because of the emotionality of struggle. Yeah, it's like you're with 17 people and you're going, we're gonna go again because we're so fucked off, right? We're driven so that it becomes like a collective anger and that collective anger is transformed into, into resilience uh, through collective solidarity. Uh, in other words, like it's an emotional process. It's not a cognitive thing. And it's the same, the same point can be made about influencing the public. The public is not cognitive. The public isn't that bothered that you've that you've then they're not going to say to you hardly anyone has said to us why are you blocking motorways when you should be talking about insulation people don't think like that like nerdy intelligent middle class professors do but the average guy in the street thinks fuck they blocked motorways what twats right that's all they think and but through the process of public public contestation in the interviews like millions of people start realizing this is a fucking big deal, right? So the real purpose of blocking the motorways is to get people on dozens of TV interviews to say over and over again, we've got three to four fucking years left, right? Because we have, this is the biggest crisis in the history of humanity. And you have to say that to people on, on the TV 15 times right and then it will start to go in <laughs> you see what because we've had 30 years of collective social repression right that's why everyone thinks this is just a problem it's not a problem it's the fucking end of the world right it's billions of people are going to starve to death it's a shit show and what we've done by putting working class people on on the tv studios is go with we're over this right we're over this shit and they're sworn they use swear words right on on the breakfast television it's a punk thing you see so you've got to see the motorway proposition in a holistic analysis of what it what it means to live at a time of massive social repression in the same way as people used to hate gay people people used to hate women right people used to hate workers you have to challenge that and say you're you're destroying your, your your children, and so it's a conduit for this social rage. And what that does then is is to build build the resource base to go and do what 
Stellan saying, right? Which is to go and block the economy, go and block the oil, the oil depots, you know, go and close down central London, go to a, you know, but to do all those things, you need like a thousand people. And we don't have a thousand people. You know, we have 200, but we'll get a thousand people because now we've got 200,000 pounds of funding, right? And getting people is a function of money because that provides, that enables people not to have to have bar jobs, right? So they can do talks like five nights a week. You see what I'm saying? Like, you've got to see in the round. Um, yeah, motorways does the job. That's my, that's my opinion. It's just sufficient. <laughs> I'm not fetishizing it, you know. Uh, yeah. Jonas, do you feel that you've had your question answered? There's a technical question about getting on the motorway, which is a very valid question, right? <laughs> so I tell you how to, <laughs> the micro logistics are enormously important. It's not like, oh, there's a motorway, go and walk on it. It's a bit. That's a bit like no. <laughs> So what, what, as I said, what most people did is block the roundabouts, which within about three minutes blocks the motorway, right? At, at, at the rush hour, eight o'clock in the morning. So you want to go to the biggest, most busy motorway in Sweden or Norway, right? And at eight o'clock. And then within three or four minutes, you, you block it. The other way of doing it is to go onto the hard shoulder. Like, do you have that in Scandinavia where there's a, there's a road which people don't go along. So they break down, they can drive off. Anyway, you go on the side of the motorway, you have placards, and then you slow down, you slow down, the, the traffic slows down. Or if you go at the right time of the morning, right, let's say you're just outside Oslo at, you know, 10 to 8 in the morning, then all the traffic's going at five miles an hour anyway, right? So if, if the traffic's going at five miles an hour, there's no substantive danger in walking out in front of it. Like if it goes 50 miles an hour, that's a problem. If it's going five miles an hour, there's no, there's, you can do it. It's not a problem, right? So there's, there's variations of thing. And there's all, the whole bunch of ways you can stop a motorway anyway, right? So you can use your imagination. I'm not going to say it on a recorded call, but there's plenty of ways in which you can facilitate it with various, various sort of mechanisms, which are still nonviolent. And, you know, you'll see different countries using those over the coming months. If you want to, Stellan, uh, could you give us a comment on what you've just heard? Um, because you were on the on the last of these calls, um, uh, especially talking about why not to block motorways. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, I think uh, Extinction Rebellion and Insulate um, UK is, is um, or Britain is 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 having the, the most important thing uh, figured out, which is about creating mass disruption. Uh, that, that's really the key. Uh, and that, that's the problem with the general climate justice movement that they, they kind of believe that the lobby work and, and legal demonstrations are actually making any kind of impression and change. So, um, but I'm, I'm kind of concerned about that. Um, the, the largest um, mass civil disobedience campaigns in history that I'm aware of, uh, that has been really impactful, they have combined a prefigurative and a strategic um, uh, approach. So like the salt march in India, which was about uh, reclaiming salt uh, against the British monopoly on the tax, uh, was built on that. The sit-ins movements within the civil right, uh, where people were desegregating uh, the lunch counters and so on, was built on that. You actually do something that is prefigurative. The, the, the landless workers in Brazil, which is the strongest civil disobedience movement in whole Latin America, is building on land occupations. So there, there, is, a, there is an idea that um, you also try to do something that um, at the same time is prefiguring uh, what you're trying to achieve. So it's not just disruption in general, which, which takes you off into a lot of discussions about you have to explain, but what, why are you against highways? Or why are you against uh, bank windows or that you crush uh, windows like the suffragettes? I mean, it creates a diversion in discussion that is making it more complicated. But if you have everyone on your side when it's needed to, to make changes of a radical thing, maybe you don't have to put so much 
pedagogical energy into explaining the issues. Uh, I mean, if I'm in the US right now, it would be a catastrophe to block highways with that kind of demand in, in the US because people are divided about the climate justice uh, issues, right? So you also need to then prefigure what, what is needed to be done. There's a reason in my view why the Extinction Rebellion is not taking off in, in the US. I hope that makes sense. I just want to come back and say like, what you have to do, Stella, is actually propose an alternative that is realistic with the resources we've got. So you have to do a resource analysis, right? Be, 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 otherwise, it's academic, with all due respect, you know. And I, it's not like I'm dogmatically anti pre I'm not dogmatically anything, right? I'm like a pragmatic, in-the-real-world designer. So if, if we come up with some super sexy prefigurative routine, and we've got a thousand people to do it, then let's do it, you see what I mean? What I'm trying yeah. to say is this is not a dogmatic, we're a motorway movement. It's it's just a tactic. And as soon as we find something else, we'll do something else, right? And I totally agree with you. In a perfect world, in inverted commas, you know, you're doing a prefigurative routine. We all know those work historically, and I, I've studied them like you have. What, what my main concern is just, to, you know, is post-COP, post we need explosive trans, transgression to build, to build, to break through the social repression. And then once we've got our army, then we go and do the job. You see what I mean? At the moment, this is a guerrilla operation, a nonviolent guerrilla operation. Uh, be, but, you know, I can give you the stats on mobilization. I think in a few months' time, we'll have a thousand people. And then you'll see something properly interesting. That's the plan. Great. Now we um, thought we would have a dis discussion in the big group and to get that started I would like to ask if there was any group that uh, got into a discussion that you didn't really finish that you think would be interesting to bring up in the in this big group and we can continue on that. Yes we had we had one issue uh, that we discussed but we wanted uh, uh, feedback from the other uh, from the big group and that is uh, Think about we had a big uh, airport action that where we're stopping at, uh, eight airports in one day. Uh, that that action was very disruptive and uh, radical. And what should we do with that action right now? Because it, has, it seems that it's very difficult to get it even more radical. Is it okay to downsize that action and just do one or two? actions on airports or or perhaps a demonstration in the air, uh, airports, uh, terminals or what, things like that. So, uh, Alfred? I think all the airport actionists should go out and uh, do a tour where you talk about your action with a whole of uh, Swedish activists. Go and lecture, go to the smallest cities in Sweden and talk about this because we have to mobilize after a big media thing like that. So you have to go out and work. And then I have another question, if I, if I may. So I have a question to Roger about where the fuck do you give them, get the money? <laughs> the $200,000, where, where do you get them? Well, the, the answer is quite simple, right? You know, Western society is going to collapse in the next 10 years, involving the greatest spasm of human injustice and suffering in the last, last 10 millennium. I mean, just think about that for a moment, right? The question you should be asking is, is, is like... Yeah, I know, but the practicalities of it. <laughs> but, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just being a little bit rhetorical, right? Because we still, oh, in no. the climate movement, we have this massive repression syndrome because everyone's Western and middle class, that everything's still okay. It's not okay. The situation's utterly fucked, right? And in 10 years time, the world will be like uh, in a place that it's never been in, you know, for the last 200 years. You see what I'm trying to say? What I'm trying to say is there's all these people out there that are even more radical than you, <laughs> right? They actually see what's happening. And a lot of them have got a lot of money. And the reason they've got a lot of money is because they're intelligent. They're very bright people. And they're saying to the climate movement, why the fuck aren't you getting your act together? And when you get your act together, we'll give you loads of money. So by getting your act together is produce 
data that proves you're going to be effective. You see what I mean? So when I go to a funder, I give them stats. I don't give them rhetoric. I don't go, hey, I'm Roger Hallam. I'm cool. Support me. I say, we've 100 people have just got 267 articles on the climate crisis in the British press in five weeks. You, know, you see what I mean? That's impressive. So I can give you a whole list of people to go and talk to, right, <laughs> in terms of the practicalities. But they're not going to give you money unless you actually go and do shit, right? You know, you, ha you have to go and to decide what you're going to do in Sweden, like this airport action, right? You're, you're totally right, by the way. Like, there's no point doing an airport action with all due respect and everything unless you're spending five nights a week going around Sweden talking about it to get the 50 people that go back in three months later and do it again. You see what I mean? This is not, <clears throat> this is, what, what we're trying to do here is, is build a, a mobilization, right? Everything is focused on that. Mobilization is a function of two things, people and money, yeah? So you've rightly said, we need money. Where you go and do the action, they'll get you money. But they're not gonna give you money just because you're looking cool because you did something to an airport. They're gonna give you money because you say, you, you know, there's five of you and you're gonna do 25 meetings a week and you've split Sweden up into 60, you know, 60 locations and you've got it worked out and you need 300 pounds for each location, right? And what we do in the UK is we go and do leafleting. So we don't talk to activists, right? Please, please, please don't talk to activists, right? Activists are really conservative, negative and burnt out, right? What you want to talk to is ordinary people who are shitting themselves about their kids dying, right? And 1% of Swedish people are shitting themselves about their kids dying. You go to their village, you tell them, your kids are fucking gonna die, step up, otherwise it's the end of Sweden, right? And, and you'll, the stats are, if you deliver 5,000 leaflets in the UK, 20 people turn up to a meeting, six of those people do civil disobedience, right? So that, that's it, right? That's the most important stat I'm giving you in this whole session. They're, they're already out there, uh, these people that will, will engage in, in this mobilization. Sorry, I was rambling on. Sorry, Indigo, are you saying something? Yeah, ju just to add, because that sounds like a huge flashy amount of money. And now we've done that, there might be some money coming in, but we did it on a shoestring. We did it with like a few thousand pounds, a really good crowdfunder text after we'd done a week of action. And, and then that's what enabled us to stay afloat. But it's like Anna yesterday, one of the ladies going to prison, she's like, and I'm looking across the court bench and they've hired these like really expensive lawyers and there's like nine of them in there with these like massive files and she's like and there's me and I had a tube of super glue and I glued myself to the road and it cost 50p and it's like you can like if the project is skint and has no money just keep going anyway and then once you are something then people will help you we're returning to the airport action that was great that was a lot of attention uh, but it was a one day thing, which is a bit like, oh, there's a blizzard in Sweden. So now the flights are stopped for a bit of time while we clear up the snow. Uh, but if you keep going and it happens again and again, people will start to realize there's something about flying that's not quite right. Um, and I think that's how you continue. You don't have to do eight airports a day if you don't have the people. But if you do one airport every other day, um, then you're sort of on the go. Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, people have already reached out to me concerning the flight action. So there are more people um, eager to take on the, the airport actions. So if we just like uh, see uh, what people are saying in the networks around us and reach out for more people to uh, carry on this uh, airport actions. Maybe there could be another set of airport actions within one month or two months or something. Ada? Uh, I was thinking like, what, what's the insulate Britain's relation to Extinction Rebellion? If you, if you do like this new freedom rider style of campaign, do you think it will boost mobilization for XR or maybe the climate movement as a whole? 
I'm trying to like figure out what happens after and and where it will fit in the bigger picture. Like, do you think XR still has its place or do you think something else needs to be created after Internet Britain? Um, yeah, I can answer that. I think me and Roger might have slightly different views on this one, but I, th I think that the idea of it is, I think, um, like a lot, a lot of Insulate Britain annoyed a lot of people within Inside Extinction Rebellion because they didn't think it was the right tactic. They thought it was too much or loads of different dynamics meant that it annoyed them. But now we've done it and it's been successful. It creates this sort of um, radicalization effect because people can see now that you can go out over and over again or they can see that their friends are now going to go to prison or they can see that, you know, the media it was the media conversation on the way up to COP. I think we, it doesn't matter if we stay as independent um, groups because hopefully it will just be uh, Insulate Britain will help to radicalise Insulate Br it, Extinction Rebellion. Um, yeah, and then also, of course, but we do need the Extinction Rebellion networks and contacts and community because it's taken years to build up and it's in group, there's groups all over the UK. So we do want to have like a good relationship with them where we can, um, you know, go go ha have access to how we can recruit um, people from local groups. Um, but it, it, yeah, so, so in some ways the relationship's good, in some ways it's not so good, but we're in conversation about it. Well, do you want to add anything? <clears throat> no, I think I think what Indigo said is right. I just want to sort of make, make clear it's a little bit of a taboo, I suppose, but basically political change works through, through two processes. It's the challenge of society to change, and then it's the challenge of the movement that's supposed to create that change to become more radical, right? So there's always two projects, which is to radicalize the movement and to create the change. And the radicalization of the movement is the process through which change occurs. So you can't create change without confrontation within the movement. You have to be in confrontation with the movement in order to get it to work. <laughs> Otherwise, it becomes bureaucratic and, um, you know, and conventionalizes itself. So, Christopher? My thought is uh, if when you begin to get a lot of money, uh, mm -hmm. any possibility that the authorities freeze the account accounts. So you have to actually keep the money on unseen, unvisible accounts. They haven't frozen the accounts. I'm sure that's not beyond them. They they took down one crowdfunder, then we made another. They they took down this fundraising platform we had, then we made a crowdfunder, and then they they like right wing press was like, oh, crowdfunder is supporting Insulate Britain, sent them an article, and then they decided to take down our crowdfunder. But we kept all the money that was in there, and now we've just gone and opened up a business account. If you have a way of making it secure, that's easy, then go for it. But if you're stopping taking action because you're trying to find the ultimate mode of security, you know, there's no time for that. So it's like trying to find that balance between what can work and what's easy and um, uh, what will keep people safe. A, a good way of making money is to, is to get the bad guys to take money off you. It's good publicity. You've got to swap. We have to, have to swap round our paradigm, right? This is not a protest for us, the state's doing us in. It's uh, it's you, the state, can do whatever you like. And the more you repress us, the more likely we're going to win. It's a different paradigm. You see what I mean? As far yeah. as I'm concerned, if the state comes and takes that £100,000 off us, that's great, because that means someone else will give it us. You see what I mean? <laughs> You've got to have the positive attitude. They're fucked, right? These people are criminals. We're going to win and they can do what they like. You know, come and put us in prison, come and take our houses, come and take our money, whatever, because you're wrong, right? You're on the wrong side of history. You're the biggest criminals in the history of humanity. We're coming. We're going to take over, guys. <laughs> you see what I mean? <laughs> this is it. You know, do your worst. That's the sort of attitude. All right, still on. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, so um, um, 
I, I just want to offer a critical reflection. Uh, although I, I think um, Insulate um, UK is, is, is really, really on the right track. I, I super much uh, support and believe in, in the mass disruption uh, approach. It's, it's necessary and it's, that's what's needed. And I also agree that uh, we need to kind of show that we are achieving results. Right, and I, that's how I understand Roger's emphasis on, on, on the stats. Um, but we also have to acknowledge that we're in a struggle for the long run. It's not just one policy that needs to be changed. It's like uh, you were saying that it's, it's a matter of inspiring the iteration that other people are following up, doing similar campaigns, changing other laws, other policies, right? So then I have the problem with that. Um, why not adopt uh, a direct action approach that is prefigurative? Um, so the way I would suggest and the way I would think about it would be uh, different. It would be like we assume the role of the government that we would like to have, a government that actually takes climate crisis serious. And then we have a press conference where we tell these are the changes that are needed and we are the parallel government that is trying to affect these. And these are the policy changes, these are the, the system changes that are needed. And then you start with one of these lists and you start to implement it. You close down domestic airports, you close down oil depots, and so on. Because then it's prefigurative in the way that people can understand why you're doing it. The problem is with highway protests, you can be marginalized, seen as criminal uh, in, in a general sense, because you will also antagonize people that think, well, highway uh, traffic is not the key problem when it comes to climate crisis. That's, that's my, my, my issue. So Stellan, what do you think of this um, um, perspective with the resources? Like if you are 100 persons or 200 persons, you might not be able to be that parallel government. Well, uh, I, I so, totally agree that you have to start small. You have to start with a campaign that is well uh, uh, strategically chosen. I, I totally agree on that. And you have to, to take the resources you have. And, and, and if you do that with uh, domestic air traffic, for example, it's enough to have one person in, in at the, the, um, the airport and they have to close down. If you have one person coming in every hour, what would that mean to, to a, a key airport? There's a vast area in an airport. How do you stop that? How do you have police surrounding the whole area? I, I think it's accessible in a similar way as to, to highways. But, but yeah, sure, you have to have a limited campaign, produce a result, because you have to inspire people to, uh, to follow up and copy and, and do a similar campaigns. All right, so Roger and Indigo, do you want to comment on that? Um, yeah, I, th I think you just, I think we're in broad agreement, aren't we? You need a small number of people to do something strategic that can't be stopped and produce results so that it inspires more people. And it's like easy to get, um, like you said, with like a list of things we need to stop. And it's easy for me to think of a whole list of things that we need to stop. But that that's not the point, is it? It's that we need to focus on one thing. And then when that one thing is working, it's going to be creating the big conversation and it's going to inspire, hopefully, lots more people to join you, you know, within Nordic countries or inspire action around the world. So, yeah, and that, that's when we're talking. Yeah, I think, well, we've already had a little chat about it, haven't we, Stellan? So, I mean, we're, we're pretty much in 70% agreement with each other, so it's no big, no big deal, right? But I, I suppose what, what I, I think maybe there's like um, three criteria, basically, to, in all this. One is, is the cognitive process of the prefiguration, which is you're stopping something that everyone wants to stop, and you know that's got a logic. So the logic of prefiguration is an important logic, but it's not the only logic. So another logic is the logic of emotion. So that's like act up. That's where people go and disrupt and get super emotional. And it's the emotionality that persuades people that there's a really big problem, right? Regardless of whether it's prefigurative or not. And then the third element potentially is the sacrifice element. So it doesn't really matter what you do, 
where there's people sitting on the road getting kicked, if there's people going to prison, it doesn't really matter what they've done. It creates a moral sort of conundrum. It creates a moral seriousness in the culture because suddenly people realise that people are willing to suffer for what is right. And, and that persuades people as well. So, you know, those are free criteria. And I would argue, you know, in terms of the reason why Insulate Britain has been successful is the fusion of the emotion of working class people being on the, on the telly and the sacrifice of, of you know, non, disciplined nonviolence in the face of people being aggressive towards you. Um, the motorway thing is obviously the mechanism through which those two things get him on the telly. It's not necessarily an end in itself, if you see what I mean. The other thing I would say, of course, is blocking, blocking airports is probably going to be as unpopular as blocking roads, because what we're dealing with here, remember, is not the oppressed people versus the ruling class. What we're dealing with is, is a whole a whole population that are oppressing nature and oppressing the next thousand generations. So the general public itself has to be challenged. It's not like they're innocent bystanders. And obviously that's a nuanced point, right? It's not to say that they're not forced into the situation, but to be simplistic about it is, 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 is problematic, I think. So, yeah, and so you never know, Stellan, we might all be jumping on planes in three months' time, you know, watch this space. <laughs> okay, Pontus. Yes, in our group, we also talked about uh, uh, the risk level of the action. Uh, uh, you can always, uh, I agree with what you're saying that we don't want to get everyone on board and like our methods, but you can't also go too far in an action. And I was wondering, uh, is it a good way to uh, experiment on the public opinion on how they uh, how they react on the action? For example, in the flight action, we had a, a, a previous summer, we had a flight action where we stopped three airports and we saw that it was fine. It was not, not too much bad publicity. Uh, and, and also connected to that one was also the risk factor of, for example, uh, uh, people dying in the cars if they block a huge road or uh, animal going to a slaughtery but dies in, 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 a, in a truck, for example. And how do you handle those kind of risks? The climate activist group Insulate Britain has uh, this morning declared the M25 a site of non-violent civil resistance. They won't say exactly where they're going to be sitting down with one of their protests or many of their protests, but they have asked drivers to either stick to 20 miles per hour or to avoid the M25 completely. Uh, but after months of disruptions and the issue of climate change now at the top of the political agenda, is it time to stop? And how tolerant should we be of protests which disrupt our daily lives. Joining us now is Insulate Britain campaigner Tracy uh, Malligan. You're in the studio, although you have been out on the road and have you glued yourself to things? You've, I have done. Yes. You've done all of that, but well, today you you're in the studio. You went to prison for doing yourself to, to the dock, didn't you? I have. I went to prison for asking a judge to do a better job. Right. Yeah. We also have journalist Dawn Neeson, who uh, actually, Dawn, you got caught up in um, an Extinction Rebellion protest, didn't you? And, and Insulate Britain, a wrestled an offshoot of, of that. Uh, this was the Canning Town protest. Um, Dawn, what do you make of... I mean, they've given us some warning this morning. Uh, avoid the M25. Is that good enough? Well, very useful, Ranveer. Um, yes, uh, well, I mean, how, how dare they? Who are they to lecture us on what roads we may or may not use? And then saying, well, if you are going to use the M25, you have to drive at 20 miles an hour. Well, I wasn't aware they were responsible for setting the rules of our highways these days. To be honest with you, around there, I'm, I'm with the majority of the country on this one, and we know that 53% of people are very, very, very angry and fed up with this situation. Only 16%, and I think that's shrinking by the day, Richard was right earlier, uh, back what insulate Britain or insult Britain, as I like to call them, <laughs> are doing. And I just think it's, it's time for this to stop. They are putting lives at risk.
Tracy, let's 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 cut straight to that chase, okay? okay. Um, mm. you, you've been quoted in interviews as saying about people who can't, for example, get to hospital appointments or operations or very serious emergencies, like the woman who suffered the stroke in the car and couldn't get to hospital because the road was, was blocked. She was with her son who was helpless to help her and she's now paralysed down one side and can't speak. And doctors have said conclusively that had she got to hospital uninterrupted, she wouldn't be in that state now. So that was a direct result of your, of your protest. So let me ask you personally, straight to it, what if that woman had been your mother? Would you still think you'd done the right thing if you put your mother into a, basically into a coma? I am finding all of this incredibly challenging, especially being in this studio and talking about it. But what I find myself thinking all the time is why, after six weeks, are journalists still focused on the what we're doing and not the why? Is it because oh, no, you must you're heartless no, no, or no. too scared I, listen, to face the listen, truth, I, Richard? I, 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 I promise you that we're going to keep the temperature low on this. We're, we're going to have a proper exchange here, unlike the last one, when like one of that. your representatives walked out after comparing himself to Winston Churchill. Well, anyone should leave a hostile environment. Yeah, well, that was horrible but, but, for but everyone. I, but I must, I must press you on that question and, and, and to answer it. That woman who, who was severely disabled because she was caught in your blockage, could have been your mother. How would you feel if it had been your mother? Would you still have done... If you'd known that your mother was having a stroke in a car 50 yards behind the blockage, would you have carried on? Would you have stopped to get into hospital? Please, anybody, if you know someone having a stroke, phone an ambulance, right? That's the responsible message. No, but that, an ambulance journalist. couldn't get to I her. thought you were going to let me finish. No, right? but you're not, I, 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 I would like to answer you, if you answer no, the question. About my mum, I'm going to, you know. Right, OK. So phone an ambulance, that's responsible messaging. If it was my mum, of course, at the time, I would be furious and heartbroken but when you then go home, we lift, have to look at the reality. Three to four years to save the future of humanity. Do you know what that means so for my children? So you allow your own mother to have a, a, a near-fatal stroke? Three to four years before my kids face an unimaginable you're future, not Richard. Question, are you? And you're not asking the right questions. Three to well, four that's my years. Decision, to be honest with you. Is it because you're heartless or too scared to look at the reality of our situation? I'm genuinely okay. perplexed why journalists are not asking the right questions here. If Do you know your... what a two-degree world looks like? A 95% chance of a two-degree world mm. for our children. Do you know what that looks like? You mentioned your children. I mean, what you're doing. Why is can't you're... we talk about what it? That's doing the conversation, it. Answering... Richard. Please important. ask the right questions, what if you're... Richard. No. What you're doing, as you see, you're, 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 re you're, you're replying to a question with your own questions. You're not actually giving an answer. So what so, you're doing is framing uh, the questions around individuals and not my children's future. Now, a two-degree well, world means way... my children facing famine, drought, starvation, a billion people on the move, and that means they face war. And you're all asking me to go home, be a good girl, write letters and sell our children out. Why are you doing that? Are you heartless or scared? Have you read the reports, Richard? What you're a your, journalist. What if your child was seriously ill. All of our children are in huge oh, trouble. The people of Britain, okay. all of our children are in trouble and they right. need us to grow up. Yes, so um, on, the, on the bad press thing, we have had like, like tons of what I suppose you could call bad press, but like I touched on it when I was speaking before, we're not, we're not particularly interested in whether the public likes what we're doing or not, because that's not the point. What we want to do is create a conversation about um, our demands. Um, and so I think it's really easy to start wanting to measure the metrics of do we have good press or not good press? Does the public opinion poll say they like us or not? But it's like, um, I think over 70% of um, the American public thought that uh, mass marches and demonstrations were, would be bad for the civil rights movement. So we can see that the, 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 the public probably won't like us because we're disrupting their lives and challenging you know, the system that we live within. Um, uh, but as long as they're asking the right questions, then, then we, we're seeing the kind of progress that we need. And on going too far, like that's something that we've spoken a lot about. And I know the block teams have spent a long time talking about that because obviously there's a really high risk factor in um, not so much at the junctions on the, on the junctions where you're stopping the stationary traffic, but you can look up Insulate Britain on YouTube and you can see some of the actions people did walk into the moving traffic and the risk factor is really high both to yourself and I suppose to the traffic. Um, and uh, but we 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 believe that you know 
this is the kind of risk that we're, we're taking and, and we're prepared to engage in that at this moment in time because the risk and the horror of the climate emergency is, is so much greater. And we want to bring home to people that this really is about life and death and, and, and we really are prepared to put ourselves in this levels of danger. Um, but of course that you know there is there is action i'm sure we can all agree it's like a big sliding scale that is too far um but it's about this alliance of the willing so if you have a group of people who do want to take a certain action and they they have really prepared themselves for it and they have really spoken about what they're going to do and they have embedded nonviolence into their thinking then they should they should be allowed and empowered to to do so um yeah. Anton? So this is probably a quite a no-brainer, but I think uh yeah, whether a roadblock is a good tactic or not, it depends a lot on the style and the design of the roadblock. So maybe we could contrast like this sort of what like XR looked like in 2019 or something, and what also we have done in Finland mostly is this celebratory uh sort of like a nice atmosphere <laughs> road blocking in the city center and then the insulate britain style is totally different i would say uh and we also tried uh once uh this sort of more more serious serious atmosphere so it, it comes down to the design of of how people sit there uh should people uh be advised to to uh chant or not to have conversations with each other or not to yeah blah 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 so there's a lot of design elements there but yeah i think that's that's something i just wanted to mention but whether whether it's it's good or not and how public is affected it's it depends a lot on the style of the roadblock elvin yes um i don't know if this is a question or not maybe not but i'm just putting out there um, well, the question is how to think about and approach this and, and the design strategy around it is that um, Swedish media and press have been terribly bad at reporting about why we're doing what we're doing and who we are. Um, so, for example, in the for those of you who don't know, during the flight action, um, there was actually a broadcast on national television going on for two hours where um, they were sitting talking about the actions um, and uh, they pretty much didn't mention the demands. Uh, they pretty much didn't mention uh, who XR is. I mean, they did they did say these things, but not in a, you know, they didn't put forward forward the activists message. And uh, from what I can tell, British media has been really good at, even though they've been bashing XR and uh, and later IB, they have um, still put forward the message of the activists. Uh, and in Sweden, that has not happened. We do actions and uh, the only people who are interviewed are the police. Uh, and there is rarely ever anything about um, our demands or what we want. Um, so that's something to take into mind as we design our strategy in Sweden. Would it be interesting to arrange another meeting like this? Alfred, did you have anything? No, not really. I was just thinking that it's a national meeting that we are in need of because we have to to make the strategy for just Sweden and the Finnish people have to make the strategy for just Finland. And, yeah. Yeah, I mean, how, how things have proceeded in other countries is there's, there's basically a network, as some of you know, of uh, activists interested in engaging in civil resistance, particularly since the end of COVID. So there will be a, a number of uh, international meetings where people are sharing the practicalities of how to organize effectively, how to mobilize effectively, and how to do action design effectively. So there's a very powerful sort of learning process going on. Because obviously, you know, if some if people in Australia come up with something really good, then everyone needs to learn about it, right? We're all working together because no one knows precisely how to do this. Uh, so the real thing is to have this real strong learning, humble sort of process, right? Where we're all working together. 
So there will be a bunch of activities. There will be a bunch of meetings coming up, and I think one or two people are on that list. If more people want to be on the list, then um, yeah, speak to the person who's on the list. I think it's Alfred or someone. Anyway, um, so that's one point. Second point is yeah, in terms of doing it in different countries, like what I tend to do, or one or two people that work with me, is I can work with you know four or five people to do a design. And there's, there is a template now of how to do this. It's broadly what I discussed in on my video, which is called How to Stop the Climate Crisis in Six Months. If you haven't seen it, you might want to watch it, uh, not because of me, but because I'm just communicating some of the best practice, as you might say, around the world. But if you do come up with a plan, I can comment on that plan and pass it around other people. And then once you've got a plan, then I can and other people can go and get you funding for it, seed funding for it. So that's probably the concrete way of moving forward. And obviously, the big issue here is it has to be an alliance of the willing, you know, like five or 10 or 30 people decide to do it, and they just get on with it. And obviously, if people don't like it, that's cool. Um, so if people want to contact me, um, I think I'm in contact with the Swiss and no, Swedish and some of the Finnish guys, but uh, let me know what you want to do. And increasingly, it's not me, thankfully, because <laughs> I've got a limited amount of time. So, uh, you know, there's, there was a, one or two guys from Germany wants to come on this call, but I don't think they managed it. But I, I will connect you with other people. Um, I mean, there's a little group around Italy, Germany, Austria, and Czech Republic at the moment who are learning from each other. So it might be worth, you know, look, getting in with those guys. Um, yeah, and, and yeah, a, a big part of this, which I haven't really discussed this evening is mobilization design. So this this is absolutely critical. You know, no no one's gonna support you for just doing an action. Like they want to know, you're doing an action and what you're doing afterwards, right? Or what you're doing during it in order to, to mobilize things. And as Elvin said, you know, there's problems with Swedish media, so, you basically have to use your own media to get out and get your message out and do the good old fashioned, you know, go around the country doing meetings routine. Um, yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you. So, Thomas, I think you get the last word for, for this evening and then we will round off the, the whole meeting. Okay, thanks. I just had a quick question to Roger and Indigo. So, regarding what you just talked about, what would you say? is the best example from from britain of an eff effective uh, action is it insulate britain or something else you're asking us so we're going to say it's insulate britain <laughs> 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 what else have we been doing <laughs> um uh well I've, i was in the cop conference for for a bit i don't know if any one from your groups was but like it's so depressing like we have to leave that behind us standing at the edge of this big gate like banging a drum like it's you know it's too late for that so I don't know that's so lots of people organizing really good talks and lots of interesting things happening there in Glasgow and apart from that Extinction Rebellion's doing good things like they closed down a oil refinery with two ex-Olympians but it was for one day and it had a small amount of coverage um uh, but cool action. But we we we're, we're like the group that's going out again and again and again, and it's definitely the 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 thing that you know people were dressing up as us for Halloween costumes this year. So like we're popular. <laughs> yeah, what I'd like to say is like is we we got to get away from thinking about actions. Like actions is so nineteen ninety, right? This is two thousand twenty one. What we need to be thinking about is like forcing the state to basically change legislation. You see what I mean? That's at the top of the piece of paper. The top of the piece of paper doesn't say what action do you want to do. You're, at the top of the piece of paper, you want to go, how are you going to force the Swedish government to change legislation? Question mark. And very quickly, you'll realize that's a six month process, right? Involving three or four iterations of ever increasing actions which fused together action and mobilization design, right? With a centralized core of organizational efficiency. It's that, that's, that's the model. So, you know, 
think about six months and three or four iterations. That's what you need to be thinking about. Okay, so thank you everyone. We now have two more minutes to go before the meeting is, is over. So I suggest that we have this kind of chat waterfall where everyone types something in the chat if you, if you want. Uh, like, what are you taking with you from this meeting? Anything you learned or got inspired by? Just type it in the chat right now. We have left to occurring actions that get us onto the morning news. Last day of COP26, I just held a banner that said no COP27. Proportionate action, uh, <laughs> disruption and moral outrage. Great to speak with 40 people. Good luck, everyone. And Stellans was, uh, Thomas, I would suggest Fastline 365 and Greenham Commons from the UK. Check them out. I am willing. Who else? We don't think about the action. Do it over and over again with breachable demands. Thank you for listening to us. Stay in touch. Let's make a global movement. Absolutely. <laughs> Legislative change now, not actions that look good. Helen is willing to do something. <laughs> uh, emotions, prefiguration, and sacrifice. Yes. Thank you so much for an inspiring discussion to the organizing group for further discussions, how to deal with the risk of repression and co-optation, very common ways that are used against strong resistance movements. We have to find ways of sustaining the resist resistance of long time. Thank you. Uh, this is also what we are gonna do, we who are orga organizing these evenings, that we we keep all the things that come in and we do things with them. So, so that's why we really want you to both uh, write in the chat right now, but also write the, uh, the notes from the groups because we're working further from what we get from you. Good perspective, interesting, thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, remember to make the claim that however big the distraction, it's always proportions in this situation. Yeah. And there are different people are willing to do things and uh, um, have ideas. And very inspiring meeting. Thank you all. Yeah, so thank you everyone for joining us tonight. I think it has been a really inspiring and interesting meeting. So uh, good luck with everything and let's keep in touch. Thank you for this for tonight. Bye. Bye. Thank you.